So here we have to the north the Sahara Desert. The colors are the topography over the region. And um, be, uh, south of the Saharan Desert, we have the Sahel region. Well, um, a, a number of the stations indicated there are operational sounding sites. And uh, if, in the next, please, um, there are two sounding networks that were set, uh, set up there, uh, so, some with additional sites added without someone using existing sites. And uh, these are form a basis for our study. And the next, there's a, a MIT uh, Doppler radar was at, uh, located at Niami, which sampled these squall lines that move through the region. So that's the focus of the study. Look at these squall lines connected with these African easterly waves. Next. Whoa, okay. So, so that network, we developed a gridded data set uh, from that, uh, all those soundings, um, a one degree by one degree gridded data set, 25 hectopascal vertical resolution uh, to study the characteristics of these way, uh, disturbances that move through the region. So this is a time series here of the onset of the West African monsoon um, that goes from, uh, June 1st to the end of uh, September, equator to 20 north. And these are averages of the uh, da daily trim rainfall in the 500 millibar vertical motion field between zero and seven east. So this uh, encompasses the most dense area of soundings. And one can see we, we have a region, if you can uh, uh, click uh, next, please. Um, one can see that up uh, through the month of June till the first week in July, most of the convection was confined to five north or south. But then uh, after the first week in July, convection jumped northward for several months. And uh, we call this uh, first period the pre-monsoon, the second, the monsoon period. So we'll look at both of those periods. Next. These are, uh, these are uh, PPI images of two uh, squall lines that moved to the region, one on 19 July and the other on 11 August. This is during the monsoon period. And most of the squall lines were of this nature, north-south oriented uh, convective lines with a trailing stratiform region moving off to the west at an average speed of 17 meters per second. Uh, the squall line uh, convective lines were a narrow course, uh, maybe 20 kilometers wide, but the uh, stratiform regions were very extensive, several hundred kilometers. So the analyses that we carried out are able to sample the vertical motion field that's divergent in vertical motion fields in the stratiform region, but not the convective line region. Next. So let's look at the changes um, following monsoon onset. If we, uh, yeah, this is an earlier version of this one. And on the left panel here, we have the pre-monsoon period. And if you look on the lower, you can see the uh, lower plot, you see the rainfall uh, peaks just south of five north. But after the monsoon sets in, you see the rain shifts to the north. And in the upper panels uh, in color are the um, apparent heat source and uh, uh, in color and the, the vertical motion field in contours. And you can see that after the monsoon sets in, the heating uh, ascends, the heat peaks ascends and strengthens and shifts to the north consistent with the rainfall shifting to the north. Next. Uh, this this uh, two panels show the pre-monsoon and monsoon periods uh, zonal wind and absolute vorticity. If you click on the next, there will be an arrow which pops up. It shows this African easterly jet around uh, between six and 700 hectopascals. Um, and then uh, the next, af after the monsoon uh, sets in, this jet shifts to the north. Um, and uh, you can see in the color there, there uh, that's the uh, absolute vorticity field shown in color. And there's a reversal in the gradient of uh, absolute vorticity, which is a necessary condition for barotropic instability. These are now averages over a long period of time. So in the mean, then, there's this, uh, uh, reversal in the uh, absolute vorticity gradient. Next, next slide, please. 
Now, these plots uh, show the potential vorticity field uh, pre-monsoon and monsoon. So uh, next, there should be an arrow there that shows um, the colors are the potential vorticity field, and there are also contours on those. Uh, we also put the rainfall in the lower panels. Uh, so prior to the monsoon, you can see there's a tongue of high PV that extends uh, from 20 north southward to um, 5 to 10 north from uh, mid-latitudes or, or the subtropics. This high PV is associated with the deep convective boundary layers over the Sahara that raise a lot of dust, and you get convective heating that uh, there's an enhanced stability at the top of this deep adiabatic layer, which leads to these high values of PV, which are extrude into the into toward the tropics. Next um, arrow, and uh, the PV field. If you look at the north-south uh, gradient of, of this uh, PV field, there, the stippling shows where there's reversals, and this uh, this goes back to the work of Bob Burpee, who shows that this. Is, indicates there's, uh, therefore, possible barotropic barotropic instability of the zonal flow um, in this region associated with uh, the African um, easterly jet. Next. So what we've done is to take a composite of, of these squall lines following the monsoon onset, and we've used uh, a work of Nieto Ferreira, um, who studied uh, nearly two dozen cases and so we've created a composite of 12 cases here. And if we look at the lower axis, there's time relative to the passage. So time zero is when the convective line passes. Negative times are before line passage and positive times are, uh, uh, positive values are times after passage. Basically, we can't uh, sample the convective line structure, but we are sampling here the stratiform characteristics that are following uh, the line passage. Next. So what you see here is the, um, after the line squalling moves by, you see warming aloft uh, and then also warming uh, in, atop the boundary layer associated with a mesoscale downdraft in the stratiform region. Next. And um, this next one shows, uh, this is a specific humidity anomaly field. You can see uh, moistening in the upper levels and drying at low levels associated with the mesoscale saturated downdraft. And the next, uh, this uh, lower plot shows the relative humidity anomaly showing, uh, actually, uh, this is the uh, total anomaly field, uh, a total relative humidity field. And you can see very moist conditions near in the upper troposphere near the stratosphere associated with the leading anvil, as well as the moist conditions uh, connected with the stratiform region. Next. Okay, now here's continue with the composite. Uh, if you click on the next, uh, the upper panel here shows the vertical motion field. And in, in the stratiform region, there's upward motion aloft and downward motion below. Next. This is the apparent heat source field. You can see strong heating in stratiform region, and then there's uh, less heating at low levels, in fact, even uh, cooling in, in the stratiform areas in some locations. But there's a strong vertical gradient in the heating near the melting level, which is indicated by that uh, dashed line. Uh, this strong vertical gradient in the heating is due to the cooling um, from melting that exists. And that strong vertical gradient in heating uh, rate is important in creating potential vorticity, as we'll see in a moment here. The lower panel is the uh, next is the um, parent moisture sink, which shows uh, large values in the stratiform region. Next. So uh, we've taken uh, out of those 12, we looked at the uh, seven northerly tracks of squallings, are those that track just south of the, uh, the African easterly jet, which it resides around 15 north. So on the cyclonic shear side of that jet, uh, we've taken seven northerly track squall, the strongest, and put them together in this composite. So if you go to next, these are total fields now. You can see there's divergence aloft in the stratiform region, and then there's convergence near the melting level. 
Next. The absolute vorticity field, there's an anticyclone aloft and cyclonic uh, absolute vorticity uh, near the melting level. And next, this is the PV, this is the total PV field. You can see uh, between a four and 500 hectopascals uh, ahead of the convective line, there's high PV, and this is associated with that tongue of PV that extends southward from um, uh, the Sahara region. But you can see it gets amplified and deepened following the squalline passage. So uh, there's something going on with this squalline that amplifies the potential vorticity field in the mid-troposphere. Next. Uh, this is an, another figure that shows the uh, composite structure for the seven neurally tracked cases. But these cases, in this case, uh, we show the anomaly fields. Next. Um, there's uh, a, a vorticity maximum anomaly near the level of the Af African easterly jet around 700 uh, millibars. And uh, this is uh, uh, on the cyclonic side of the African leaf easterly jet. So basically, as the uh, squalling moves by, there's a circulation that uh, intense comes in that sort of intensifies, um, amplifies the vorticity several, uh, say, six to 12 hours after squalling passage. Next. This is a lapse rate anomaly. Basically, the high values here mean increased stability. So where there's melting, it enhance, there's an enhanced layer of stability in this region. Next. And um, this is a PV anomaly map. There's an upper level, uh, or at least uh, uh, around 400 to 500 HPA, there's a positive PV anomaly, and this is connected with the heating over the Sahara. Next. And a little bit lower, uh, residing near the uh, melting level, which is indicated by the dashed line, that's zero degrees C, there's a PV maximum that shows up there connected with the melting. So we have sort of two sources of PV coming into the picture here. Next. So this, we put together in a summary here uh, a, a sequence of, of slides uh, going from 24 hours on the top to 24 hours, hours, uh, 24 hours before to 24 hours after squalling passage at Niami. So on the left side there, there's a uh, uh, PV anomaly uh, field is shown in color at 700 HPA, as well as the circulation anomalies and the uh, sounding arrays are shown with the star indicating Niami. And in the green uh, segment is the uh, schematic squall that's approaching the region. Uh, it's not always that structure, but it's shown for, for reference. And uh, next. You can see there as uh, squalling moves past the uh, ra MIT radar site, there's a circulation center to its south. Uh, and that's uh, at around 700 level. And it moves off toward the west following that squall uh, system. Next. This uh, second row of, uh, of, of panels is the, uh, the flow at 600 HPA. The melting level is at around this, near this level. It's actually 500, 575 HPA. So this is near the melting level. And you can see this, uh, the structure uh, with PV is different this time. As you go uh, after the squalling passage, the uh, Niami site, you can see a wake of high PV, and that's connected with the melting uh, in the stratiform region that, that covers a huge extensive area. Next. I've repeated the, the panels at 600 on the left in this slide, just what we saw before showing this large wake of PV behind the line. And on the right is a uh, the uh, same panels, but at 500 HPA. And uh, if you hit the next, uh, you can see here there, there's a PV anomaly that extrudes down from the north into the region and eventually at 24, plus 24 hours uh, enters into the 
uh, region just behind the squall line. So here we have uh, two features of different source, two PP sources. One is associated with melting and another appears to be um, anticyclonic Rossby wave breaking. Although we need to look into this in more detail and go by looking at analyses farther to the north that comes into the uh, region and amplifies uh, the PV behind this squall system. Next. So to summarize here, we have a composite uh, that shows that uh, if we look at the composite PV structure, we see an enhanced PV behind these squall systems. And um, by the way, two of these squalls became uh, topical cyclones, Debbie and Ernesto. And it's uh, the merger of the PV anomalies from two sources, uh, one associated with the melting uh, that extends this PV anomaly a little bit lower down, and the other uh, from um, the Sahara and heat low, uh, basically, area uh, that has the PV uh, increase higher at a higher level. So you get an expansion and strengthening of the PV anomaly, uh, which could potentially then uh, provide for more potent seedling disturbances for Atlantic tropical cyclone genesis, perhaps a mechanism seen in no other part of the world because of the unique uh, um, situation over West Africa. So uh, the last slide is this one here next. Uh, we've looked at convection uh, connected with African easterly waves, uh, and it typically takes the forms of squall lines uh, with leading convective lines and trailing stratiform precipitation. The radar and sounding data from the, the AMA are used to investigate the characteristics and the composite of AMA squall system really reveals a prominent mid tropospheric composite of PV anomaly in the trailing stratiform uh, precipitation region, which has two sources, a squall line dynamical microphysical processes, namely melting, and secondly, deep atmospheric boundary layer of the Sahara layer, which gets uh, pulled into the uh, squall system from the north. The merging of these two anomalies can yield potent incipient disturbances for TC genesis over the uh, uh, Eastern Atlantic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, for that very insightful uh, account of the of the way West African monsoon uh, is manifest. I think th this is very uh, detailed, and, and in fact, I, I'm amazed that the I'm up data is still feeding uh, so much, uh, so many studies in, in helping us understand the West African monsoons. Uh, this is great. Uh, we actually ran out of time, uh, but at the same time, I think we can take one quick question if anyone has uh, from the uh, uh, people who have joined the WebEx uh, session. Madhu? You can unmute yourself. And unmute yourself. Ask your question. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Very good presentation, sir. I, I would like to ask that uh, this mid-level uh, potential vorticity plays an important role, where it's connected to the mid-level moistening uh, through uh, potential vorticity because of uh, the vorticity causes the merging of many clouds. I just want to uh, view on that, sir. Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understood a question about the. Uh... Uh, what role does moisture play? I, I, I couldn't quite follow the full question. The potential vorticity in the mid levels are connected to the moistening of the mid levels over the African, uh, like 700 to 600 hectopascal. The moistening of that uh, thing is a preconditioning for the convection invigoration there. I must apologize. I, I still couldn't quite get the question. Um, but I, uh, uh, but I'm, let me ask answer a uh, point on a different uh, thing. Perhaps it is of interest to the Indian monsoon. These monsoon depressions, I think, have a lot of stratiform precipitation, and this similar process may play a role in helping to spin up uh, these circulations. Yeah, maybe uh, Madhu, you can probably put your question in the chat box and then uh, get the answer uh, 
during the course of this session. So now we will move on. Thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, for that excellent presentation uh, uh, on the West African monsoon. Uh, now we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Mithyunjai Mohapatra, who is the Director General of Meteorology, uh, IM, India Meteorological Department, and also the permanent representative of India with WMO. Uh, in fact, he will be getting into another important aspect that is impact based forecasting. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra is uh, very well known in for his contribution to cyclone forecasting. In fact, he is popularly known as the cyclone man of India. So he actually will be talking about uh, the monsoon forecasting uh, on short to medium range scales uh, and how impact based forecasting uh, is, uh, uh, is, is uh, happening and what is the current progress and, and what are the plans. Dr. Mohapatra, you, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, and Dr. Uskumar, uh, and distinguished uh, panelists. Once again, I convey my greetings to all the distinguished delegates and participants for this International Workshop on Monsoon and for this special session on the ground monsoon. So I'll be talking about the short to medium range impact based forecast of monsoon in India, the progress and plans. Uh, my slide is moving, and uh, Rukmar Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fine. Yeah. So you know that um, uh, southeastern monsoon is uh, uh, a predominant weather system, affecting all socio-economic activity in the region, and the southeast monsoon starts in the month of May and continues um, till the middle of October. During this period, as the monsoon uh, intensifies gradually and moves towards the north, we encounter a number of severe weather events. To top all the severe weather events, we experience the heavy rainfall, leading to thunderstorms, floods, and landslides in different parts of the country and this region. We also experience the thunderstorms associated with weather like lightning, gust, squall, and dust dumps. And there are many low pressure systems developing during monsoon season that includes low depressions and cyclones. During onset phase of monsoon, we also experience the heat wave conditions. And sometimes during the break monsoon conditions, also there are heat wave conditions. The heat wave conditions aggravate during monsoon, especially over northern parts of the country, when you have the monsoon because of the combined impact of temperature and relative humidity. As you can find out from this uh, uh, graphics that the southwest monsoon for the country contributes about 70 to 90 percent, on the average is 74 percent of rainfall during this June, June to September, if you consider. Then if you consider the internal variability of monsoon, you will find that though there is an SEO rainfall of about 88 centimeter over the country as a whole, it has a variation of 10 percent for the country as a whole, but spatially there is a large variation from west to east and from north to south. The monsoon is orographically dominant and hence leading to many severe weather events in the orographically dominant regions like the Himalayan region and the Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats. So, if you just look at over the years, the monitoring and forecasting in the short to medium range, you will find that there is a significant improvement with respect to all these severe weather events which are occurring in the monsoon season. Especially if you talk of the cyclones, yes, there has been um, almost zero error in many extremely severe cyclone storms passing over the area in the recent years. As a result, it has led to the minimization of loss of lives and properties. You can find out an example here, the super cyclone Ampan, which crossed uh, during the onset phase of monsoon in 2020, May. You will find that it was well predicted, not only with the genesis, or track, intensity, and associated severe weather. There has been about 40% improvement in accuracy of various types of severe weather events, including monsoonal heavy rainfall, the cyclones, the heat, heat waves, and the thunderstorms in the recent five years compared to previous five years. You can also find out monsoonal heavy rainfall. We stand at now about 75% accuracy 
in 24 hours ahead and 60% accuracy five days ahead in predicting the occurrence of heavy rainfall. Similarly, the thunderstorm fusion locate, we can predict the thunderstorm from 85% POD one day in ahead and also three hours ahead in the non-casting scale. So when we have got such a good forecast accuracy, but still what we find that the loss of property continues. So now the question is why the good forecast result in poor response? An accurate and timely weather warning does not guarantee always the safety of lives. I'll show some examples. It is mainly because the weather models and other hazard models are not coupled every time. And there is lack of scientific and technical capacity to translate the hazard information into the impacts. There is inadequate communication channels which can fail during the event to reach out to the last mile. And there is lack of appreciation and utilization of available vulnerable information like maps, geophysical, geospatial with higher resolutions. And also many countries and many times with the specific severe weather, we may not have the effective decision support system. So that's why if you just find out uh, the impact of, for example, the cyclones losses in different countries in the Southeast and region, you'll find that there's a huge loss in terms of the absolute value, also capital and other social losses. So if I take an example of the, the severe weather events, this is the cyclone Tithli, which crossed northern parts of Andhra Pradesh uh, and during the withdrawal phase of monsoon in the uh, month of October with the monsoonal gyre. And um, we could provide, provide a very good forecast about the track intensity landfall, but still 77 people died in Odisha because of the landslides. So landslide, there was no prediction mechanism and hence the impact in terms of the severe weather of landslides not be provided to the people and hence people were trapped in the landslides. Similarly, if you just consider another example, in 2013, the Kedarnath floods in Uttarakhand of India, there also you will find that though there was forecast, but the impact forecast was not there. Hence, people could not understand and took not take action to minimize the losses and more than 4,000 people died in one event. Now, if you just um, uh, considering all these things, so what we want actually, we want a paradigm shift from a simple forecasting to the impact-based forecasting. So from information-based forecast to the impact-based information and fixed best warning. So for this purpose, we not only need observations, forecast, and warning, but also we need observations, forecast, expected impacts, and risk-based warning. So to carry out this, so what um, uh, the issues, if you look at the issues, first of all, is a challenge, then you, because you are shifting from simple forecasting to the impact-based forecasting, then it comes the methodology. The methodology differs from country to country and over the period of time or so. Then you need some kind of solution towards the decisions and you have to practice whatever you introduce operationally. So objective is that the weather forecast is being converted to impact forecast, which will help in a hasty decision to a well-prepared decision by the disaster managers. While doing so, we have to go for an integrated data system, data utilization instead of the isolated data, then we have to go for an interactive mechanism instead of only broadcasting the information to the disaster managers, the general public. And above all, we should keep user first design concept. So far, many national meteorological agencies, they feel the priority in formulating their weather forecast without taking into consideration the user's mindset, user's design except the user's expectations. So the impact of focus starts with user's first design concept. So therefore we will be converting the weather information into the response mechanism through weather translation and impact estimation. So therefore as a weather forecaster, we were feeling that we have a lot of information so which will be useful to the user, but user feels they have a lot of information which is not linked to the weather at present. So therefore these two ways of green and um, orange they have to merge with each other so that um, uh, they can work together, becoming a rectangle. So what we need there for actually a collaboration mechanism among the weather forecasters and the risk managers to have a realistic risk-based warning. So in, the, in this background, India Metrology Department has um, um, taken up the steps for implementation of the impact forecast 
during monsoon season especially and also for other seasons. So what we do in this, actually we try to understand the warning needs for early actions through various meetings with the national testimony authorities, state testimony authority. Then there we go for partnership and collaboration with many agencies within the country and outside. At the same time, we go for hazard forecasting. We try to prepare various types of severe weather indices and hazard modeling. It goes towards the risk assessment. Then we assume, then you assess the likelihood impact with the probability forecast and many other. And uh, by that, um, we come for the level of impact. So considering all these um, left hand side, right hand side, as it is shown here, we go for the impact forecast, then we go for dissemination and prepare for the early action. Then of course, we have to go for verification, review and improvement of the system. So when you consider all these things, we are following the four standard uh, methods. The first method we adopted is the threshold method that is defined a forecast threshold at which people or infrastructure in a specific location are expected to be negatively impacted. Then you go for the second method that is qualitative combination method where we create a composite index that combines relative uh, vulnerability with forecasted hazard magnitude and create a relative priority. Then third method, we go for the impact modeling methods. There, what we do actually we combine the hazard magnitude with the vulnerability and exposure to predict the level of impact. And finally, we go for the climate sensitive method using a combination of the socioeconomic baseline data and climate data and identify the areas where vulnerability is most closely correlated with the forecasted climate risks. So if I look at all these things where we stand now, for stage one forecast, the stage one impact risk forecast, we started very early. For example, in 2013, we started this color coded warning for the heavy rainfall in monsoon season after the Kedarnath episode. Every disaster gives a lesson. After that, we started this one and this was just based on the simple mechanism of giving heavy rainfall, very heavy rainfall, and extremely heavy rainfall, and giving a color code just based on the own experience of the forecasters. So by that way, we just made a beginning about the heavy rainfall impact based forecast. But in the stage two, we came up with some kind of qualitative combination with the different types of thresholds. So we defined whether it will be one day rainfall, whether it will be com well, the composite of two days rainfall. And by that way, we could find out the hazard modeling and hence the expected impacts. In the stage three, if we just look at, we went for implementing the impact based forecast for heavy rainfall during monsoon season in four stages. We issued 48 hours in advance or three to four days in advance a heavy rainfall watch at the district level. So all the districts in the state were given the warning about the impact expected due to the heavy rainfall. Then it was followed by the stage two, that is heavy rainfall alert 48 hours in advance, then heavy rainfall warning 40, 24 hours in advance. In stage four, 12 hours prior to occurrence, we started giving every three hour informations. So while doing all this in the stage three, what we do right? We collected the climatological data of the past impact based on different thresholds. The climatological impact expected we consider based on disaster weather events published by India Metrology Department since um, 1980s. So all these um, helped to have a, some kind of impact matrix at the district level and at the city level. The accordingly impact was provided. So therefore, uh, by 2020, we could come up, in spite of the COVID scenario, as some kind of standardized standard operating procedure for four stage impact risk forecast at capital cities and all the districts. Then we went to for stage four in 2021, partially dynamic impact risk forecast. Here, all districts throughout the country were provided based on certain dynamical information generated. I'll show you certain examples. We considered climatology, considered geophysical information, exposure, vulnerability maps, etc. And hence, we have now a GIS based platform with all this data and where we can morph the information and take a decision. So, this is just an example what we do with respect to monitoring the heavy rainfall so that 
we can provide realistic information every three hours to the general public and disaster managers. Then we went for predicting the rainfall. A lot of information has been developed recently by the dynamical statistical modeling, ensemble modeling, and also the multimodal ensemble scheme of Minister of Power Sciences involving IMD, IATM, and then National Center for Media Management for Forecasting. All these are being utilized to have a realistic forecast and hence the guidance for the impact. So if you just uh, look at the module what we have developed for impact-based forecast of every rainfall during monsoon season, you will see that we have considered the not only the immediate rainfall, but also the past few days rainfall is accumulative, assess the soil moisture, and assess the standing water, and hence the impact of the forecast rainfall. So we consider the climate extremes also, we consider forecast up to five days rainfall, and then we go for sector specific products in the production module and standardized SOP and customized bulletins. In the meantime, also we went for capacity building by conducting the training for the forecasters and the stakeholders. So if you just look at um, the same thing it is represented here, so what we do actually, we consider the administrative layers like state, district, city, ward boundary, then digital elevation models, land use, land cover data, rainfall data, infrastructure layers, demographic data, then major point of interest data like school, college, hospitals, airport, bus stand, communication, etc. So these are all under development, but to a large extent we have developed the framework as it is on here. Now, if you just look at some of the data what we've collected, it is very difficult to collect data for impact risk forecast. What we have done actually, we have gone for two sources. One is the open source data set, Pan India, it's shown in the left hand side figure. The other one is the government sources as data collected from state governments and other agencies. You can find out that data collection is picking up the entire country is still not uh, having all the data. We consider all types of exposure conditions as mentioned here, up to the power sectors, communication sector, tourist spots, water bodies, transport sectors, and many more. So if you just look at an example of uh, the impact of heavy rainfall, the hazard modeling, short or impact modeling, what we have done actually, Apart from all these heavy rainfall forecasts, we've gone for urban flood modeling. So starting with two cities, we have taken up Mumbai and Chennai, where urban flood modeling has been demonstrated with all the socioeconomic data and it being provided in case of anticipated heavy rainfall. To take care of the flash flood which occurs during the monsoon season, especially over the hilly areas, we have a Southwest South Asia Plus for guidance system where we provide the guidance for next 48 hours, 24 hours, 12 hours, and six hours in terms of flood depth, flood threat and the flood risk. For river and flooding, Central Water Commission and India Meteorology Department work together. And with the prediction of heavy rainfall and quantitative precipitation forecast, the color-coded impact risk forecast is being provided by the Central Water Commission of uh, Minister of Water Resources, Government of India. There, I just want to mention, there is involvement of the stakeholders in the form that National Disaster Management Authority, India Meteorological Department, and Central Water Commission meet together every day through a video conferencing and formulate the impact expected due to the flood over a river catchment. Now, coming to the cyclone, which occurs uh, in during monsoon season, especially during onset phase and withdrawal phase, so we have a very systematic approach over the period it has developed. We have a genesis forecast 15 days ahead, then five to seven days ahead, we have the major range forecast, then it follows with the track forecast, intensity forecast, structure forecast, landfall point and time forecast, adverse weather warning, and damage expected, and action suggested. And the forecasts are very user-specific and sector-specific. It goes to all disaster managers, the coastal shipping, port warning, fishermen warning, aviations, public, media, etc. in different stages like pre-cyclone watch, cyclone alert, cyclone warning, post landfall outlook, and of course, the de-warning. <clears throat> While picking the impact risk forecast in 90s, we went for the historical damages with different stages. Just based on the different stages of the intensity of the cyclone, we could find out the, what is the damage expected and action suggested. Initial was adopted in 1990s, but over the period it has uh, been formulated and reviewed as for the expectation in consultation with the disaster managers. But finally, in the recent years, we have got a dynamic impact risk system. I'll just give an example of the cyclone Ampan, which was a super cyclone and crossed West Bengal and adjoining Bangladesh coast on 20th May during the onset phase of monsoon. You can find out that the first and foremost requirement for impact forecast is the realistic, reasonably correct the track and intensity forecast. As you can find out, red one is the forecast track, black one is the actual track. They were almost coinciding with each other five days ahead. And that gave a, 
enabler that give that become an enabler to take the impact risk forecast seriously by the disaster managers and to take actions. So if you just find out the um, severe weather and the impact expected with the cyclones, these are mainly the heavy rainfall leading to floods, and you have got the weeds leading to damages, the structure and the storm surge leading to coastal inundation. This is just an example. You can find out that we have done uh, first we have done for climate risk and hazard analysis. We have identified the various districts which are prone to the storm surge hazards, or wind hazards, or the maximum precipitation hazards. On the left-hand side, you can find the probable maximum probable precipitation, which is expected with a cyclone. On the right-hand side, you can see the flood zones in Ampan and the affected population number because of the floods. And on the bottom, you can find out what are the various types of social attributes which are expected to be damaged by the cyclones. All these attributes are being prepared on real time and being provided to the district collectors and the state authorities and national authorities to take preparatory actions. And you'll be happy to know that based on all these, nowadays, Government of India has introduced the response mechanism in which the financial forecast is being provided based on this, and government sends money to the states prior to landfall of the cyclones. Now, if you just look at the wind, you can find out that um, India Environmental Department is a very good um, mechanism for monitoring the wind and its impact. All types of uh, uh, platform, including satellite, radar, coastal observations, climatology, are in hand, and we provide the forecast for 28 knots, 34 knots, 50 knots, 64 knots. I want to say that unlike other ocean basins, here we provide the wind speed forecast more than 28 knots. It's mainly because that our ocean basin is strong, strong, small, and also the fishermen here are poor comparatively, and therefore boats cannot sustain even the wind more than 28 knots. So therefore, this type of wind impact forecast helps the fishermen to save their property and also to save their lives. Now, if you just look at the wind hazard analysis, for example, Ampan, this left-hand side diagram is the probable maximum wind as per our analysis uh, for different districts along the coast. And here is an example of the wind speed forecast and impact over the West Bengal due to the cyclone Ampan. You can find out how clearly this GIS based Dynamic Risk Assessment Atlas is bringing out the expected impacts. Now, this is an example of the storm surge modeling, impact modeling, and hazard analysis. On the right-hand side, you can find the probable maximum storm surge analysis based on the long-term data. And here, we have got three models. One is the nomogram, other one is the storm surge model developed by IIT Delhi. Then we've got Infias advanced circulation model to provide the coastal inundations. All these three are being utilized to provide inundation. And this is an example of inundation provided during the cyclone Ampan for the coastal districts of West Bengal. And accordingly, the different structures and different uh, facilities and utilities which are exposed to these storm surge that were predicted and information are available to the government and other agencies to take the actions. Now coming to the uh, another important hazard which occurs in monsoon, that is the thunderstorm. You know that in the thunderstorm, we have the lightning, we have got the squalls and gustness, we have got the hell storms, and also we have got the floods sometimes because of the heavy rain, especially in Northeast India. So therefore the vulnerability are quite high due to the lightning and other hazards in a thunderstorm. You can find out, uh, I've just uh, noted down here, the various types of impacts of the thunderstorm necessary to weather, which made people the vulnerable. So what we did actually, we started initially with a threshold mechanism, giving the different colors like green, yellow, orange, red, depending upon the winds associated, depending upon the um, uh, expected uh, ghost and squalls, and uh, depending upon the health storms and etc. We also consider what is proposed the climate logic of various parameters like health storm, dust storm, tornado, strong winds, etc. By that way, we could find out some kind of vulnerability mapping by considering those winds which has led to the damage to the structures and loss of lives that is also mapped. And this is just an example of how the hazard modeling has been done for thunderstorms with respect to dynamical models and also with respect to observational data sets from satellites and radars. So what we do now actually, all these informations are being integrated with the socioeconomic attributes as it is shown for the monsoonal heavy rainfall and the cyclones. So um, this is just an example how the dust storms can also have the impact along with the hell storms and floods. So this is another example of what we are doing actually. We have developed some kind of vulnerability atlas of India at the district level and also the city specific level. We have developed the climate hazard vulnerability atlas of India by IMD, as you can be seen in this diagram here. 
it provides the vulnerability due to various types of thunderstorms, lightning, dust storms, and hailstorms. Now, last but not the least, that is the heat wave conditions. As you will all know, that um, uh, India is very prone to uh, high temperatures, especially in the month of June, July. And for that purpose, we continuously monitor and provide some kind of heat wave warning. And at present, we have a heat action plan across the country and for all the capital cities where we provide the information about the heat wave and expected impact in collaboration with various health agencies, state government agencies, central government agencies, and municipal corporations. This is just an example of the heat wave warning in a multi hazard map. To further aid the vulnerability assessment and hence the risk, what we have gone for that we have prepared the wind impact and relative humidity impact. We have calculated normalized vulnerability index of the heat wave and also the uh, climatology of heat wave based on long period data. As you can see, this is the month of June. All these informations are for the month of June, for example. You can find out the central part of the country, how vulnerable it is towards uh, the heat wave conditions, even there is monsoon. <clears throat> we also try to develop some kind of heat hazard analysis for the month of June, as it is shown here, considering various parameters. So for example, consider only maximum temperature or minimum temperature, duration of heat wave, relative humidity, and wind speed above normal temperature days, and some of all the weights we consider, and to find out, to try to zonation, to do a zonation of various types of districts in the country, depending upon all these parameters. So finally, we have come up with GIS-based uh, heat wave information, uh, where we have the specific attributes, for example, it is shown here, Indian railways and national highways. There is transport sector which is affected by the heat waves. If there is a, uh, uh, train passing from Delhi to Calcutta, and there is heat wave conditions across the road, then the authority has to make arrangement for uh, AC conditions, the water conditions, drinking water specially, and other arrangements. Individuals also make arrangement for that purpose. Therefore, the association attributes lead increase impact with forecast of heat wave, especially the monsoon season, is certainly helping the people to minimize the loss of lives. As all of us know, that number of loss of lives is reduced significantly due to the heat wave also. There was only four deaths last year compared to 2,000 deaths in 2015. Now, while uh, summarizing, I'll say that IVF in India Metrology Department has come up a long way with respect to methodology. We have come up with the objective methodology and objective hazard modeling, impact modeling, and we are in the process to add the socioeconomic attributes. So there has been uh, some color coding to begin with, then we have gone for extra, introducing the temporal range up to five days, then spatial range of one of two locations, city, districts, and region level. Forecast, we've gone up to probabilistic forecast modeling system. Then hazard type, we have considered all types of hazards as mentioned here. And language, we have come up with initially English, but now we have got tri language, that is English, Hindi, and the local language. All the sector specific informations are being provided almost in the semi automatic method, utilizing all types of dissemination in local language that is helping the local media and the people. So if you just look at um, the future plan, this uh, stage four of the impact and risk modeling, which is going on now, it will improve further. And by 2025, we should have a reasonably accurate impact based forecast and risk based warning system in the country for all types of weather up to five days at station level and at the district level. <clears throat> Now, if I just look at uh, another challenging for this purpose is the decision support system, which is underway to develop for each and every individual uh, severe weather. And then, of course, we'll go for a multi hazard warning system. So, if I just look at uh, while introducing all these things, verification is very important. And at present, we do not have a quantitative verification of the impact based forecast that we introduced from next year. So, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to speak on this evolving impact-based forecast risk-based warning system in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahapatra, for that very comprehensive and really interesting uh, presentation. In fact, uh, this actually is very encouraging that we are now finally uh, able to uh, achieve uh, the full value chain benefits of weather and climate services. Uh, but of course, the real challenge is actually to get a handle on, on vulnerability and exposure, as you have rightly highlighted, uh, which actually is based on human systems, and it may be uh, uh, quite a big challenge for us, for meteorologists, 
uh, to actually get into. So we definitely need partnerships with uh, the concerned stakeholders. Unfortunately, we ran out of time completely. In fact, we are now uh, behind, but at least if uh, anyone has a burning question, probably one question we can uh, uh, have before we break. I see no hands. So thank you very much, Dr. Mohapatra. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, this very uh, informative uh, talk. So now we will have a break for about, since we are behind the time, we'll break for about 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, reconvene at- 10.15 uh, local. Yeah, 1015 local, that will be uh, 445 UTC. Okay.
Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. <laughs> good morning. Okay, good morning. <laughs> Here it's almost 2 a.m. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not a very easy time to, to give a talk. <laughs> uh, we start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, could you just remind, remind me how to share? So I have to, sh to share yeah. my, my screen. screen. Yeah, full screen you share. Uh, so here. And now what do I do? Then you go to your PowerPoint and... Uh... No, no. no, no, no. First, you share the screen, madam. Pardon? Yeah. At the bottom yes, of the screen, screen, you can see three options. Mute, start video, and share. So click on the share. Um, I'm trying here, but... But since the presentation is already... Or, or shall we... The organizers the they can you? share it, if you like. It says, I tried last week and it worked. No, I don't. Alice, no? Yeah. Hmm. Maybe the organizers can share, Alice. Yeah, we can share from our end. Uh, I, would, uh, I would rather yeah, yeah. control the presentation. Yeah, that is true. Uh, this, is, this is who has said, you have said, our organizer has said, this one. Somebody. So, Madam, at the bottom of this app, you can see, yes. mute, start video, and share. Start. Now, the... Uh, the, the the video is already on. Share. And, uh, One more option, share. So you see a button called share with an arrow, upward arrow. It's in the bottom. Yeah, I, 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 I have already uh, click on the share. chosen, share and, uh, yes, click it on this uh, option. But I, I, I don't know why. This Are you getting any permission issues? So I, I should choose a full screen or so, just yeah. a window? At the leftmost panel, you can see screen one. Or full screen, full screen. That is better. Yeah, I, I, am, I am clicking on the full screen, but nothing yeah, happens. After, by clicking leftmost panel, then there is one more click you need to do, share. Now it's... Um, it can, can you yeah. share? I see and I click on the options, but uh, nothing happens. So, so perhaps we... Um, Perhaps we then uh, get the presentation from your side then. Okay, okay. Bushar, can okay. you share? Yeah. I think that is better. Okay, welcome back everyone. So the next presentation, I, we, we go to the uh, another aspect of regional monsoons in terms of the American monsoon. So we now have uh, Professor Alice Grimm, uh, who is a full professor in the Department of Physics in the Federal University of Parana in Brazil. So she will be speaking about uh, interannual. Uh, inter now, uh, okay. So she will be speaking about interannual and interseasonal variability of the South American monsoon. Uh, Professor Grimm uh, has, has a long experience in working on the American monsoons and she is well known. Uh, she's also uh, served as uh, a member of the uh, 
WCRP Clivar Chivex Monsoon Spanel. Uh, so uh, we look forward to her uh, presentation on the South American monsoon. Professor Green, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I will talk about the combination of interannual and intraseasonal variability of the South American monsoon, uh, focusing on the MGO modulation by ENSO. Next, please. Here you can have uh, an idea of the intensity and of the uh, extension of the South American monsoon. Uh, so uh, from the annual cycles of precipitation, uh, you can see that most of South America is uh, dominated by monsoon regime with much rainfall during summer and almost no rainfall at all in winter. And uh, in the uh, figure uh, on the right, uh, you can see the uh, average, monthly average of precipitation in several monsoon uh, core regions around the world. So you can have an idea of the intensity of the South American monsoon. Next. Uh, well, let's first uh, give you uh, an idea about interannual variability in uh, South America. Uh, and of, uh, an idea of the importance of ENSO for this interannual variability. So here you have the continental modes of interannual variability for total annual rainfall and uh, seasonal rainfall. Uh, only the first modes, uh, just for summer, uh, we are showing the two first modes because summer is our focus in this presentation. In all these first modes for annual total, winter, spring, autumn, you can see a very strong influence of uh, ENSO on these first modes of variability. Here in the, in the summer, uh, when I, I talk about summer, I am referring to austral summer. Uh, it is the second mode which is related to ENSO. And it doesn't uh, impact very much on the core monsoon region, actually. But the first mode has a very high factor loading on this uh, core monsoon region. Although it is not uh, strongly connected to a well-known SST pattern. Next. Uh, the mechanisms for ENSO impact on South America uh, are local forcing, as in Western tropical South America, and atmospheric teleconnections, which actually uh, are the main mechanism of uh, the influence of ENSO on South America. Uh, these teleconnections can follow a tropical pathway, um, through equatorial, uh, Kelvin and Rossby wave, which change the Walker circulation as in Eastern equatorial South America, and an extra tropical pathway uh, through Rossby wave trains, which produce, uh, uh, which are produced by Pacific tropical convection. Uh, and this, uh, extra tropical teleconnection change circulation and precipitation here in subtropical uh, South America. Next. Next, please. Uh, besides uh, teleconnections, 
another uh, me mechanism of uh, variability uh, in, in uh, of rainfall in South America is uh, surface atmosphere interaction. There is a relationship between precipitation and spring and summer uh, in such a way that uh, there is a, a tendency to reversal of anomalies here in, uh, in this region, in this core monsoon region, from spring to summer. There are uh, significant correlations between these modes in spring and summer, and um, a mechanism, and an explanation for this tendency to reversal was tested uh, with uh, regional model. Next, please. Well, and this can also be seen here in the evolution of precipitation in central East Brazil compared with uh, climatological precipitation evolution. Next. Uh, here we have then uh, for December, January, and February, the anomalies, the precipitation anomalies during El Nino. Uh, uh, we have uh, below normal precipitation in the Northeast uh, South America and above normal here in Central East and Southeast South America, in the opposite, more or less, uh, during Lani. Next, please. Uh, next. So uh, let's introduce uh, the intraseasonal variability in South America. Here we have the the contribution of synoptic and intraseasonal time scales to total variance of summer rainfall in South America. You can see that intraseasonal variability has a great contribution here in Central East South America. It's, uh, it's a very significant contribution. Uh, while um, synoptic variability has a much stronger contribution here in the western part. Uh, looking at the intraseasonal variability here in this region, uh, it's possible to see that this variability has components in uh, three main variability bands from 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and 30 to 70 days. And uh, this, the spectra of this uh, vari intraseasonal variability in this region shows that uh, compared with the uh, reference uh, red noise, uh, the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is here in this band, uh, has a very significant contribution. Next, please. Uh, the first three rotated modes in the uh, intraseasonal time scales are these ones. So we have uh, the, uh, the three modes are actually among the five uh, uh, mo uh, first modes of all this in, in these three bands, time uh, frequency bands. So these two first modes are dipole-like modes, one uh, with highest factor loadings here over the South Atlantic convergence zone. Next, please. And uh, here in this 30 to 70 day band, it's possible to see it's the first mode and this is the second mode. And this mode here, uh, this second mode is connected with equatorial circulation, uh, uh, either a westerly or a easterly regime for wet and dry phases, whereas this mode here is connected with extratropical uh, perturbation. Next, please. Next. So let's first take a look 
at the uh, Madame Julian oxidation impacts uh, in uh, average over uh, all three possible ENSO states, neutral state, El Nino and La Nina. So without uh, discriminating by ENSO state. So we can see that the uh, most uh, the, the strongest uh, convection, it uh, propagates from the Indian Ocean uh, till Central Pacific, where uh, it uh, extends southeastward here in the, the uh, South Pacific, in the subtropics of the Central East South Pacific. And when this happens, uh, uh, starts uh, uh, enhanced convection over the Central East South America, which reaches its maximum in phase one of MGO. Next, please. Uh, when, uh, when we have this uh, enhanced connection here or suppressed convection in, in uh, phase four, uh, there is also in the subtropics in South Pacific here, a strong low level convergence here and low level divergence here. Uh, in this, these regions, in the subtropics of the Central East South Pacific are, according to analysis of influence functions, uh, very efficient regions in, in which anomalous upper level divergence or convergence are very efficient in producing uh, extratropical teleconnections towards South America to produce uh, circulation anomalies and uh, precipitation anomalies. Next, please. Next. Well, here we can see uh, that, uh, oops. Uh, let's look uh, just at, well, here we can see then this uh, in phases three and four, uh, low level convergence here uh, and in phases seven and eight, low level, uh, high level, this is high level, high level divergence and here high level uh, convergence associated with suppressed, here in this case, with suppressed uh, convection and here enhanced convection. Next, please. Uh, well, here it's possible to see uh, that while you have this, this anomalous convection, upper level divergence uh, in the equatorial belt, uh, and not much anomalous convection in the subtropics, uh, there is no pattern of extratropical teleconnection here over the Pacific. But when this upper level anomalous divergence extends into this uh, influence region here in the subtropics, uh, extratropical teleconnection starts forming here. And it's delineated in phase eight, start forming in, in phase seven, delineated in phase eight and fully established in phase one, when the anomalous convection over South America is at its maximum. Next, please. And then in phase one, we have the highest precipitation here, which can reach 
more than four millimeters per day, the anomalies uh, filter in uh, intraseasonal bands, so anomalies from other sources are not included. And this represents uh, around 35% of climatology. So it's a, a, a pretty strong uh, impact. And in these other phases, we have suppressed convection. Next, please. <clears throat> well, these, uh, which of these uh, anomalies, convection anomalies here in the Pacific are responsible for forming this uh, wave train here, responsible for these anomalies over South America. We, uh, we use it, these upper level divergence as, as forcing in a simple model, and we are able to reproduce this wave train with uh, anticyclonic and cyclonic circulation here. Uh, but what exactly, uh, what, which of these anomalies is, is responsible actually by these circulation anomalies over South America? So looking at influence function uh, for these two action centers here of this anticyclonic and cyclonic circulation here, we see that in this region here, where there are the strongest convection anomalies, this region here in the subtropics of Central East, South Pacific, this, two, this region here is the most efficient region to produce these two circulation anomalies. Next, please. <clears throat> and this is confirmed with uh, uh, simulations using uh, as forcing only parts of these convection anomalies. So using this one, we don't get the right anomalies over South America, uh, neither from these or the combination of the two. But when we use this here uh, in, in the subtropics of the, uh, the Central East South Pacific, we get exactly this, this uh, wave train connecting to South America. So the most important uh, convection anomaly is not uh, the, the, the strongest one is that one which is situated in a region of, of the highest influence. Next, please. <clears throat> so now let's see what ENSO changes in MGO. So first, uh, let's see. Just a moment. <clears throat> let's start with the ENSO influence on the frequency of MGO phases. So here we have the relative frequency of MGO phases during El Nino, La Nina, and neutral years. Uh, it seems that the background ENSO-related anomalies influence the relative occurrence of MGO phases with similar patterns of circulation or convection anomalies. For instance, uh, MGO phase one here on the left, it's relatively more frequent during El Nino and shares some common features with El Nino. For instance, suppressed convection over the equatorial Eastern Indian Ocean and Western Pacific and mar maritime continent here, while enhanced convection predominates over the equatorial Central Pacific, which is uh, something that is observed here uh, during El Nino. Uh, 
On the other hand, the phase five, uh, which is relatively more frequent in La Nina, uh, displays opposite uh, common features with La Nina. Next, please. Well, in ENSO states, in, uh, how ENSO states affect the MGO propagation? Here we can see that quicker, well, we know from previous work that quicker or slower propagation is expected for weaker or stronger convection. During La Nina, the stronger convection here over the maritime continent, here the Eastern Pacific, and the western uh, the eastern indian ocean and western pacific uh, uh, this stronger convection is consistent with slower eastward propagation as can uh, be seen here uh, comparing with el nino uh, uh, du during el nino the anomalous convection over the maritime continent is weaker and does not reduce much as it moves uh, over the maritime continent to the Western Pacific. Uh, uh, and it extends further uh, during El Nino uh, into the Central Pacific. Uh, yet during La Nina, the zonal wind anomalies, they propagate quicker over the colder East Pacific and anomalous convection is earlier established here over South America than during El Nino. During El Nino, the, the highest convection anomalies happen in phase one and during La Nina in phase eight. Next, please. Well, here uh, we can see some uh, features uh, comparing uh, of OLR anomalies, comparing uh, for El Nino and La Nina, these OLR anomalies. So we can see that uh, during phases eight here, phase eight and one, uh, uh, when MGO uh, displays enhanced convection here in Central Pacific, which is something in common with El Nino. And these anomalies are enhanced here. While during uh, La Nina, they are really not enhanced. They, they are weaker. Huh? Uh, for instance, let me show just one more example here. Um, here in uh, phase five, six, huh? uh, during El Nino, we have a propagation of this enhanced uh, convection uh, across the date line, whereas in La Nina, it doesn't happen. Uh, the, the convection propagates only in the subtropics, but during El Nino, it propagates uh, across the date line and is uh, very enhanced here in phases uh, eight and one. Uh, as a consequence, this uh, subsi uh, anomalous subsidence over northeast South America, which happens in phases uh, four, five, and six of uh, the MGO, this is enhanced because of this enhancement of this convection in Central Pacific. So subsidence here is strengthened. And during La Nina, this subsidence here disappears. So we have even uh, enhanced convection here. So uh, this influence of the background state of ENSO can, and that is many, there are many other examples, uh, can uh, change this 
anomalies associated with different phases of MGO. Now, let me uh, emphasize that during phases seven and eight, uh, and here and also here, uh, uh, there is an enhancement Please, of this excuse me, Alice, uh, anomalous think, convection. Pardon? Excuse me, I think uh, we have to wind up because I think we are running out of time. Thank you. Uh, well, and uh, next, please. Uh, I, oops, I just wanted to uh, to emphasize here that this subtropical convection, which is important to establish this teleconnection towards South America, it is enhanced not only during El Nino, but during La Nina, it's a non-linear effect. This here is the difference between the, uh, the anomalies in El Nino and neutral years. And you can see that in both cases, this subtropical convection is enhanced. And uh, the, the uh, wave train, eh? Uh, is uh, well defined during El Nino and La Nina, while in neutral years it's very weak. Next, just to show the the effect here on precipitation. These here are uh, anomalies of precipitation of observed precipitation. It's not OLR, uh, where we can see the effect of enhanced subsidence here over uh, during El Nino, here over Northeast uh, South America, whereas during La Nina, you can see that the subsidence is uh, weaker and we have even enhanced precipitation here. And due to this enhancement of the teleconnections uh, towards South America, we have much stronger uh, precipitation anomalies here in Central East South America than in, norm, in neutral years. And over the ZACs, over the South Atlantic Conversion Zone, uh, this is uh, enhanced in both El Nino and La Nina. Uh, I think I'll I'll uh, stop here. Although there there were some interesting results in extreme events, uh, but due to the uh, time, uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much, Professor Grimm. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, and sorry that you are not able to. Uh, complete the presentation, but we appreciate your uh, flexibility with the timing. I know this is uh, uh, almost more beyond 2 a.m. And it's really nice of you for sparing your time at this hour. And it also shows your commitment to monsoon research and also the uh, uh, workshop on the monsoon. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, your presentation and uh, in case there are any questions, probably we can uh, get in touch with you uh, separately. So we will uh, move on to the next presentation. So the next presentation is by uh, Professor Laila Carvalho, also again on the American monsoons. So she is uh, uh, a professor of geography in UCSB, University of California, in Santa Barbara, and and. Uh, she actually uh, she uh, is one of the co-chairs of the WCRP Climate Geoex Monsoons Panel, and she is closely involved with the uh, international workshop and also the International Monsoons Project Office. Uh, so I now invite uh, Professor Carvalho uh, to begin her presentation. She would like to uh, share her presentation by herself, and I hope this works uh, without any problem. Okay, do you see my, my screen? 
everybody? Yes. Yes. We, okay. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. You Perfect. see? Okay. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm Leila Carvalho. Um, and uh, I also would like to, to thank my, my team, my collaborator, Charles, for uh, his, um, his, uh, uh, the PI of this project and uh, all the staff that has been working with us uh, for this project. Um, I, I will start just showing a little outline. I will give a short overview of the South American monsoon variability. Then I will talk about low level jets along the Eastern Andes and then uh, some classification and analysis of those jets. And I will provide some conclusions. But I have to start by talking about of the monsoon, how we, how, what is the monsoon in South America and how, what are the main features? And then here we see it's just a mean for DJF, mean precipitation and 50 millibar winds uh, showing uh, uh, the main features of this South America monsoon very clearly the South Atlantic conversion zone in this region here has this oceanic part and continental part. Here you see the Chaco Low, also very famous. Uh, when you look at upper level, then we also see the Bolivian High uh, as part of the monsoon. But what I like to, to do when I talk about the South American monsoon is to show the monsoon when you remove the mean annual cycle of the winds, because then it looks much more like other monsoons. And what we see here in colors is precipitation, uh, winds are anomaly uh, uh, after removing the annual cycle. So you clearly see the cross equatorial winds. We see a, 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 a cyclonic anomaly in this region related to convection um, and also see the SACZ in this region. We don't actually see much of the Chacolo because this is there year round. Uh, I want to point out also the importance of this cross equatorial flow to the, uh, to the southern hemisphere as part of the monsoon. But then the monsoon also has active and break phases. At least talk a little bit about this. In the active phase of the monsoon, this is precipitation in color. Vectors are showing winds, and I'm showing the actual winds, not anomalies. Um, and then you can see in the active phase, I did this uh, based on an index. I'm not going to discuss this index, but um, this is basically uh, how the active phase um, is, uh, should look like. So you have more precipitation over central and eastern Brazil in this region and less precipitation over northwest Amazon in this region. Then in the break phase, you see more uh, strong easterly winds. We clearly see more of the anticyclonic rotation in here, less precipitation over eastern uh, Brazil and more precipitation over northwestern Brazil. So in, when you take the difference between the two, then we clearly see that you have a less suppressed convection over northwestern Brazil and uh, more uh, precipitation over eastern and also uh, over where you see the, the SACZ region and less precipitation over southeastern uh, uh, South America. All these features are very important and less precipitation also in the ITCZ, which is very interesting uh, when you see the difference between active and break phases. So um, let's talk a little about the jets and the importance of the jets. So there are a few low level jets that are very well known in the Americas. Um, we have the, the uh, they are traditionally studied separately. So we have this famous South America low level jet, which is uh, we see here in this region. Uh, uh, this is Eastern Bolivia. Then we have the, the, uh, the North uh, jet we call Orinoco, some call Orinoco jet. And then you have Caribbean jet, and then you have the Choco jet. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on these two over South America, um, and also trying to understand if if they are related, and how and how they play a role for the monsoon. Um, but before I talk about that, I need to to 
briefly discuss how we we calculate how we 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 use this or found out about the the jets so we used the uh, uh, four reanalysis uh, five reanalysis actually we use the bonner criteria which is the criteria that has been proposed for the united states uh, to define about the the low level jets uh, we we actually we modify the bonner criteria to be adapted to south america because this criteria is very tuned to the to the jets that have been studied in the, in the northern hemisphere so we used similar we are using winds uh wind shear but we are also using percentiles of the winds instead of using thresholds we use percentile we use six hourly reanalysis and we look uh, i'm going to show first uh, by looking at separate regions where we know the jets exist, we are we know climatologically we see the high uh, uh, standard deviation in the winds. We we then we are going to look into these uh, two regions separately. Okay, so when you have these South American low-level jets, the famous jet over eastern uh, Bolivia in this region. Um, if we have a uh, maximum winds in this region over here they tend to be nocturnal they are the type of nocturnal type of of a jet and uh, the importance of this jet is that it transports a lot of moisture from tropical regions to the subtropic here what i'm showing just to to, to emphasize is uh, is the anomaly relative to climatology when you have the jet very strong in this region so you can clearly see that when we have this low level jet strong moisture is transported to the subtropics and away from the monsoon and you see more of the anticyclonic circulation this is low level um, and then the easterlies and then the relationship with uh, suppressed convection in this region um, now we are looking at the northern Orinoco low level jet again during DJF. So this is the region where we observe the jet. Um, and then we see this is a composite for the cases, the days when we have those jets. And you can see this is precipitation and winds. And uh, it's very clear uh, where the precipitation is more enhanced. We see enhanced precipitation along the uh, the Andes region in this region and also along the continental part of the SACZ. Uh, when you contrast these uh, uh, observations with the climatology, again, we see um, more precipitation actually over the monsoon region and a suppressed precipitation where we see the jets is strong and the reason for that is that well you have stronger jets you have a divergence of the winds divergence of 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 moisture fluxes so you would expect to see less precipitation and this 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 moisture is transported by these anomalous uh, westerly winds along the the region of the monsoon so this is why this jet is is important uh, to be uh, well understood. Now I'm showing, uh, this is a, a published in this paper. Um, this is a composite also of this uh, a northern jet, focusing more on the northern jet, uh, showing uh, uh, winds anomalies, SST, and here we are looking at upper levels. We are looking at upper levels because uh, it is clearly showing the wave train, at least, at least showed very well there is often related a uh, wave train propagating over South America when we have convection along the SACZ. And we do see this happening. So there is, even though we have the jet in this region, we clearly see the importance of having both hemisphere um, uh, uh, perturbing uh, circulation um, in both hemispheres. This is upper levels. When you look at low levels, uh, we see that uh, a very clear anticyclonic uh, circulation. This is the, the North Atlantic uh, cyc anticyclone becomes stronger. And this is also important in transporting uh, moisture across the equator towards uh, South America. Uh, in low level, you also see the cyclonic circulation, anticyclonic circulation. So the existence of this jet is a combination of, uh, of uh, interhemispherical dynamics leading to the increase of the jet that ends up affecting the monsoon. 
But most also important is that this jet seems to be increasing, intensifying um, over time. Um, we see that they, they have been uh, increasing in frequency over Venezuela, Colombia, and also in wind speed, as you can see in both cases here, those um, uh, trends are statistically significant, which is also important in, in understanding the variability of the monsoon in recent years. Um, now, if you look at what is the, the seasonal cycle of those jets, you see that um, for the, the northern Andes is actually peaks in March, but also in the pre monsoon season, which is which is very important. Um, whereas the the the, the jet uh, at central jet, it peaks in the winter. But we have also uh, sometimes you have both jets uh, simultaneously. And I and you know that you have seen as I showed before, uh, they act in, in different ways, right? Almost opposite ways, but often they appear simultaneously. So we we are interested in understanding uh, what kind of circulation and when do they happen simultaneously? When do they happen independently? So the way uh, we answered this question was by uh, not being so uh, 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 subjective in defining what the jets are, but uh, allowing more of a, this variability to be recognized um, by uh, the methodology. So what we did, we we look into the reanalysis uh, again winds, um, and uh, and then we define a mask along eastern Andes, all this region uh, for for uh, using all these regions, and then. We identify for every grid point when the criteria for a jet was uh, occurring. So we use the same criteria before that we use for some points, but now for all these grid points along the Andes, just to find out about what kind of regimes we, we find. And then we get about 1700 maps um, that uh, uh, pass this criteria. And then we use uh, self-organizing maps, SOM, uh, to recognize those patterns. Uh, this was an unsupervised uh, neural network tool that uh, used this geospatial data. So here is the data. You have the input data. There are some weights um, that is being applied. And then the methodology, the method finds maps or nodes um, that uh, then we will recognize uh, based on, on weights and um, as being different patterns. So this methodology, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, if you have more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, but um, it then it, it end up giving uh, this, this methodology actually gives 208 nodes, which is a lot. We're not interested in all those possible nodes. So the way um, we do in order to separate what it, what matters to us, we then go through a, a KME clustering method to capture the, the most uh, important modes. In this particular um, method, we end up having some supervision, right? We have to decide how many clusters are important. And then we came up with this uh, after several tests uh, with the, what we thought, thought was ideal. So we have this uh, 10 clusters and you can see that uh, some of these clusters indicate that you have, uh, say in this case, more of the northern type of jet uh, that becomes stronger in these four first clusters. Then you have uh, met, uh, some of that show that um, they actually occur simultaneously when you see the color, uh, pink colors indicate strong, strong southerly winds, uh, northerly winds, sorry. And then you see that in some of these clusters, they occur uh, together. And then uh, you see these last three ones I show when you have this eastern central and this uh, uh, jet is stronger, right? So you can use this now to try to understand some of these mechanisms, I'm going to shortly show you uh, the northern jet by itself, right? The simultaneous and the central jet. And what is interesting, I'm, I'm showing uh, uh, lag composites 
um, uh, so leading two days, leading one day, uh, uh, and doing the jet. And you can clearly see how uh, as the jet becomes stronger, uh, a very clear relationship with the westerly winds and the intensification of the monsoon, whereas you see more of the suppression, you see this, this cyclonic, uh, uh, anomalous cyclonic uh, circulation forming here. This is low level, right? And uh, enhancing convection over here along the SACZ, where you see the convergence zone. And then if you see when they are the simultaneous, well, they are competing, effects are competing. So we don't see much of this effect. And uh, actually the, north, the, the central end is, uh, seems to, to be more important in enhancing precipitation a little bit in this region. Of course, when you have the central Andes and not the northern Andes, then you have a lot more of this suppression here and uh, moisture transports to southeastern uh, South America and causing extreme events in this region. So in conclusion, um, this South American monsoon is strongly influenced by the behavior of the low-level jets. Uh, this research points out that the north and central low-level jet play a distinct role in modulating the monsoon. The northern jet is more important for the active phase of the monsoon. There is also evidence that the fre frequency and intensity of the northern jet is increasing, which is important. And the SOM is a useful uh, tool to be less arbitrary in identifying the jet and their behavior. And they can be useful to characterize mechanisms associated with the active and break phases of the monsoon. So thank you very much for your attention. And I, I stop sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, Laila, for the very interesting presentation and and you are uh, in a way to ways to uh, make diagnostics of the low level jet. I think this is uh, of interest, I think almost for all the, even the other regional monsoons. Uh, so if there are any questions, I think we can take one question if someone has uh, a question. Can you raise your hand if you have a question? Okay, I see no, uh, uh, request for floor. So thank you, Laila, for that excellent thank presentation. You. And we appreciate you also for <laughs> late in the night. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking my coffee. <laughs> so I can't thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Come on. So the next uh, speaker is a uh, of course very well known uh, uh, monsoon expert internationally uh, celebrated uh, in, in, uh, in the monsoon community, uh, Professor B. N. Goswami. Uh, he needs no introduction to the monsoon community. Uh, he actually has uh, led many uh, programs uh, in the Indian Institute of Science and also uh, more notably in the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. So he, uh, the next presentation is about uh, uh, the teleconnection between uh, North Atlantic SSD and the Indian monsoon variability, which is actually a, a new way of looking at the Indian monsoon variability teleconnections. Uh, Professor Goswami, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Rup Kumar. Thank you very much. Can I try to share my screen? If it works, uh, then I'll uh, work with uh, my sharing. If it doesn't, I'll quick, quickly go back there. Okay, let me try to share the screen. Okay, you can share. Okay. Is it uh, is it visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. 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 So okay. Great. Then uh, then I'll make it full screen. Uh, is it okay? It's okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic. Uh, let me let me. Uh, so why am I talking about uh, this uh, teleconnection between North Atlantic and Indian monsoon rainfall? So basically, my talk is about uh, this Indian regional monsoon, Indian monsoon. But uh, in the context of Indian monsoon, I think uh, the drivers of Indian monsoon has been a uh, has been a, 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 a big question for a long time, and we have uh, known that uh, El Nino is a major driver of Indian monsoon variability. But uh, over the years, we have also known that there are association about uh, uh, Indian monsoon with AMO, 
There is also with IOD, PDO, and NAO. But none of these associations have been uh, have been uh, have uh, 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 the robustness of these associations are not very well established and and uh, whether they are really drivers of monsoon and uh, independent of uh, El Nino has not been established properly. So over uh, so many years, even the causality or the or the direction of drivers, even in the case of El Nino, uh, we are not sure because it is possible that an Indian monsoon can also affect the El Nino, while El Nino can influence the monsoon. So. Which direction does it work is has not been established even today very well. So one of our concern has been to establish the drivers um, and uh, in that connection, the causality well, has been uh, has been a major concern over the years. So the, which is what are the, what what are the drivers which have a direct causal association with monsoon? And in that connection, we have done some uh, recent works uh, where we have established the. Uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, this causality amongst the several of these divers. And this is the theme of my talk. And uh, I'll come back to this picture here uh, at a later time. So um, uh, uh, so basically, why is, uh, why we are talking about the connection between uh, the uh, the North Atlantic and, and, and Indian monsoon? In the context of this is that, uh, that in the, <clears throat> as we know, the Indian monsoon is, is a very complex system. Uh, it has uh, several different uh, variability from biennial oscillations to multi decadal oscillations. Association with El Nino is quite well known. And it is also known from predictability studies that uh, Chandi and Sukla and work, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is considered to be a highly predictable system. And its potential predictability, potential scale has been estimated to be about 0.85. Unfortunately, however, all actual skill of all prediction systems today is less than 0 0.7. Um, uh, uh, and that is, uh, uh, that is what we have been able to achieve after monsoon vision, but uh, it has always remained below potential skill. So that is, has been a, a major question why. And that is essentially, uh, I believe that there are two reasons for that. One is, of course, the models have their own biases uh, and the prediction models need to improve bias and that is happening, uh, uh, happening uh, steadily. And however, more than that, we have been not been able to identify all the potential drivers of monsoon clear, clearly and include their contributions into the prediction system uh, properly. And that, I think, is major concern. And in that context, uh, in my talk today is in that context, uh, we, I am going to uh, sort of uh, identify the association with the North Atlantic uh, uh, monsoon as, a, as a, one of the most important potential drivers. And that is, uh, uh, the, the, again, the, uh, the importance of this is, is that over the last uh, uh, last 100 years, uh, Sir Gilbert Walker discovered the sudden oscillation and association with Indian monsoon. And that is, of course, led to the uh, connection with the El Nino and sudden oscillation. So over the, hundred, the last 100 years, uh, the, uh, therefore, ENSO has remained a single most important driver of the Indian monsoon uh, and for its variability and predictability. Unfortunately, the association between monsoon and, and so has been has been has been epochal, has been varying, and over the recent years, in fact, it is very very small, uh, very very low, uh, very poor correlation. And even when it was in the best uh, best of times, their association explains only about thirty five percent of the variability of monsoon. So therefore, a lot of variability is not explained by monsoon. Where does it come from? We must identify them, and that is the need to identify non answer drivers of monsoon and they uh, and incorporate them into the prediction system. That is why this connection with AMO is important. But uh, what have been the problems? So therefore, we need to go beyond Toga or beyond and so and and Toga. So we have to look beyond tropical SST or maybe even extra tropical SST possibly could influence monsoon. But uh, but we have not paid enough attention to this. There has been, of course, uh, there has been uh, uh, has been indications that North Atlantic uh, uh, temperatures indicate uh, uh, influence the monsoon in centennial and longer time scales because mega droughts of Indian monsoon have been associated uh, with uh, with uh, cooling in the North Atlantic, and 
Over the last uh, 15 years or so, we have investigated the disc association between monsoon uh, in, in North Atlantic uh, SST and Indian monsoon uh, on interannual and multi decade time scales. And we find that that is quite a robust, but a robust association. Uh, uh, but there are, some, there are some issues that we need to, needed to clarify, and that is what uh, my talk today is, 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 is on those issues. Teleconnection. <clears throat> Uh, 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 and, 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 and one of the issues, of course, was to establish uh, the, the, what is the physical mechanism by which uh, the North Atlantic SSD could possibly influence monsoon. And so that teleconnection mechanism has, over the years, last decade or so, has become uh, much more clearer. I'm going to give an uh, give example of that. Uh, uh, but there are some few major con conceptual concerns uh, because uh, the concern was that uh, the, 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 the tropical SST in print uh, teleconnection has to happen through this circulation, right? So it is a kind of a, a atmospheric breeze. Atmospheric breeze has to happen through the circulation. But how does the North Atlantic SSD, which is a pretty uh, extra tropical SSD, which is pretty mean SSD, is very cold? How does those cold SSD or variations of those cold SSD could influence the circulation? which then influence the teleconnection. And that has been a, a, a major conceptual problem because the very unlike uh, unlike uh, unlike tropics, the variations in the mean mean sea surface temperature over extra tropical region or the North Atlantic is much lower. And at that time, uh, even the small change, uh, uh, I mean even the large change in SST does not change the evaporation uh, uh, so much, and therefore uh, cannot influence the con convection like it does over the uh, over the tropics. Therefore, there is a question uh, about that. In fact, uh, people uh, uh, general thinking has been that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, that uh, it is not the SST that influences the circulation in extra tropic, but the circulation affects the SST through fluxes in the extra tropic. This has been a connection. Therefore, there has been always a conceptual problem of how SST could have influenced this. Uh, but uh, uh, in the next few uh, few slides, I'm going to show that in fact SST can influence the tropical extra tropical circulation, not on synoptic time scale, but on the slower time scale like uh, uh, like uh, super synoptic or the intra seasonal time scale or seasonal time scale. In fact, in that time scale, SST indeed can influence the, uh, influence the uh, circulation and it can influence uh, vorticity uh, and circulation, and that can produce a certain forcing in the atmosphere. And that forcing then, therefore, not simply just the SST convective forcing, but by changing the circulation itself, it can produce vorticity forcing. That vorticity forcing can introduce uh, again uh, uh, circulation anomalies that can produce atmospheric breeze. Uh, uh, so, uh, sometime back, we had actually identified that on in, uh, in, 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 uh, 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 that on multi decadal time scale, uh, the North Atlantic SST and Indian monsoon rainfall are pretty well correlated. And so, therefore, there is a there in in a, in in addition to the centennial time scale, uh, there is uh, there is a relationship between the uh, the North Atlantic SSD and uh, and and Indian monsoon rainfall on multi decadal time scale. Uh, now. Even on interannual time scale, that there is a relationship, and that relationship has been recently studied by uh, uh, one example of such relationship is the study by Bura et al., where they looked at uh, all non and so drought year drought years of uh, of Indian monsoon, and when you do composite of all the sea surface temperature anomalies of non and so El Nino drought years and El Nino drought years. These are El Nino drought years and non-El Nino drought years. El Nino drought is, of course, El Nino signal is very strong. North Atlantic SST is very weak. But on uh, uh, non-El Nino drought years, the North Atlantic has a very strong cooling, very significant cooling. And there is no SST signal in the tropics. There is no El Nino signal. In, in nowhere there is a major signal. So, uh, so, so the, so the uh, tropics is in the transition from between El Nino and La Nina, and there is no signal, and only signal that is there of SST is in the extra tropics. In the so there is uh, there is clear uh, indication that SST in the extra tropics may have influenced the, uh, the, the, the non, uh, non uh, the drought years in that uh, in in the monsoon. And how did they do that? So they they, they looked at uh, they looked at found out that uh, if you do composite of these. Uh, 
uh, uh, on seasonal mean time scales uh, of the wind anomalies associated with uh, uh, these these events, uh, uh, the, you find that it is there is a strong teleconnection through uh, a, 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 a wave train, a stationary wave train, which uh, um, uh, goes all around the world, including coming over India. And this is a barotropic wave train, which is sitting on the top of this SST. It starts over the North Atlantic and then produces a stationary structure around the globe. And, uh, and that influences the circulation over Indian, in Indian region. Uh, uh, and that circulation then affects the rainfall, uh, rain, uh, modulates the rainfall over uh, monsoon region. So therefore, this is the teleconnection. The connection is the wave train, which has been initiated by a barotropic vorticity over the uh, over the uh, North Atlantic, and this barotropic vorticity happens to ha uh, ha happen to uh, happens on on on, on interseasonal time scale. They are episodic. They last for about three weeks, and then then uh, then die, and then again produce another one event. And in the season, if there is a, uh, there are two events, it really produces a major. Uh, a major structure like this, and that uh, is essentially what influences monsoon. So we have found that the, exactly the same same uh, uh, Rossby wave train also influence on the multi decadal time scale. So we did we did a, a sort of regression of this uh, SST. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, multi decadal component of monsoon uh, on the winds and geopotential height, and it shows exactly the same kind of Rossby wave, uh, stationary Rossby wave, which influence, uh, and that uh, that part is amplified here in this region to show this same kind of Rossby waves which affects uh, the circulation over, uh, over our region, and that influences the monsoon. This is quite different from the ENSO kind of teleconnection on an interannual time scale where. The wave train is in the meridional direction. Propagation direction is sort of meridional. But here, this is kind of a zonal, zonal waves itself. But there is an extension of that wave towards subtropics, which influences our region. So this is the difference between, and, uh, and this is this is now sort of uh, it's pretty well uh, documented now. <clears throat> so so that is clear. But the question is, uh, uh, now how does that actually affect the monsoon rainfall? It turns out that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, as I said, uh, these, these, these uh, waves or the barotropic vorticity over that uh, uh, SST region is, is is episodic of interseasonal time scale, and that interseasonal time scale uh, it sets up uh, this uh, stationary wave, modulates the stationary waves on the interseasonal time scale, and that interseasonal uh, modulation essentially. Modulates uh, the uh, the interseasonal activity over the monsoon region, and it sort of uh, uh, <coughs> sort of uh, 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 what you call phase locks these mon monsoon active and break spells uh, 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 as uh, 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 long active and break spells are phase locked with the uh, seasonal cycle, and that phase locking in the case of positive AMO gives rise to positive uh, active spells. And uh, and they are very much associated with the vorticity. In the, this is the vorticity uh, 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 activity in the in the, in the North Atlantic uh, barotropic vorticity. So this barotropic vorticity seems to drive these uh, these uh, active spells. Uh, and same thing happens in the opposite thing happens in the AMO negative phase. So this is based on several about 20 years of data on interseasonal time scale. They always seem to every time when there is a positive thing, they tend to phase lock. Uh, uh, the active spells uh, during a, uh, during a part of the seasonal cycle, and therefore, even when we do composite, uh, the active spells uh, seem to be uh, is, are there, uh, uh, or break spells are there. So, therefore, the uh, uh, the uh, circulation modulates in such a way to uh, to uh, to phase lock the uh, long active or break spells, uh, in and th thereby affect the seasonal mean. So, therefore, uh, the mechanism is now. It essentially happens through interseasonal uh, inter time scale. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, the sum together of these interseasonal activity gives rise to even on this uh, on the on the on the stationary wave. Uh, 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 the interseasonal time scale, the stationary structure is same as the seasonal structure because uh, the the sum of these give rise to that. And 
some of the seasonal structure is same as the is as the as the multi-ticketal structure because some tubular of that seasonal structure actually results in the multi-ticketal structure. So therefore, it's the same mechanism which affects from the intra-seasonal time scale all the way to the multi-ticketal time scale. So that is the uh, the mechanism that we know. But still, there is one big question about how the vorticity. Uh, uh, how the uh, peripatric vorticity is produced by the SSD? Do the SSD really drive the peripatric vorticity? So that question was not not very clear. So what uh, to do that? We did certain lead leg -like analysis of uh, SSD and peripatric vorticity in in in, in over this uh, all the all the grid points in the northern <coughs> uh, northern hemisphere and. Uh, and uh, and we did for that we, we removed the uh, 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 synoptic variable day by doing quickly data rather than daily data or filtering it just weekly data and if you do that and do a lead lag -like, uh, relationship it turns out that the maximum correlation it happens one one uh, one week uh, one week after the SST uh, so FSST leads the uh, vorticity. And of course, there is a negative correlation, but that it happens over in uh, uh, North Atlantic as well as over North Pacific. These two things are uh, both are part of the same system. Uh, um, AMO is associated with positive anomaly here, also positive uh, positive anomaly here in this region. So, or negative anomaly here, or negative anomaly there in this region. So, therefore, these two are connected, and this indicates that SST could do this. But still, this is 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 is, is, is still the linear correlation analysis. So. Still, the cause and effect was not very clear. Now, cause and effect, uh, 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 it is not clear because, um, uh, uh, because uh, uh, these uh, this are basically linear. But most of the functional relationships are non-linear because the time scales are different, right? So one is on internal time scale, one is on multi-digital time scale, uh, and then 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 some intra-seasonal to multi-digital. There are different time scales. So this, so therefore the relationships are actually non-linear. So how do we establish that? So um, and also the con conditional independence of these drivers have not been established. So therefore. What we did is, 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 is we, start, we, we, we decided to calculate the causal connection between uh, ISMR and and so as well as in the presence of the other drivers. So so what this can be done today with a different uh, uh, techniques are available. Venger causality and uh, this has been used in AI and ML uh, uh, field a lot. But but here there is another one something called PCMCI. Method which is also very popular today, and uh, and there is I cannot go into the details of that, but we use this PCM say plus method, which in, in uh, and 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 uh, calculated a, a sort of this involves this methodology involves this uh, uh, this uh, 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 this lead leg relationship or the lead leg regression, but uh, uh, but also he is it, it it uses the nonlinear dependence between them. So and then uses a large number of ensemble to find probability, uh, a probability of which direction connection, which lead lag is is correct, and which lead lag has the higher probability, and then establishes a statistical significant association, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 um, directional association uh, with the with the driver. So what we did is that we we looked at uh, all these at uh, five different potential or six different potential drivers uh, and. Use this PCMCI method to uh, see if, uh, find all the possible connections between them and see which one is uh, which one is actually uh, driving which one. So with that leads to something very very interesting, and we find that so this what it means is that so this uh, whenever there is this uh, no directionality so that means that this there is uh, uh, there is a, a simultaneous lead lag relationship. So this the, the straight lines are simultaneous relationship. But this uh, uh, the curved lines means there are uh, uh, lag relationships. So so that means this is a positive, and the color uh, re represents positive uh, or negative correlation. So this is a positive correlation with a lag of uh, of, of um, positive uh, connection with a lag of three months. So IOD is it can drive and so with a uh, it, it, uh, with a lag of three months. Uh, on the other hand, ENSO has a direct connection with. Uh, uh, with a simultaneous connection, which we know, uh, and so it has a negative connection with IM. Um, but I am uh, ISMR can also influence the ENSO with a lag of uh, lag of one month. 
Okay, but most interesting thing that we find is that so when this there is no directionality, that means we are DAD method cannot find out from the data. We cannot really have a clear idea of who 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 is affecting whom. This is called confounded uh, relationship. So. Uh, uh, so therefore, the simultaneous connection between IoT and uh, Nino is is not clear which one which one is affecting which. But uh, but IoT seem to have an influence on uh, in Nino. Uh, on the other hand, I think the most clear signal that has come out is also that AMO is a definite driver of uh, of uh, of ISMR um, with a with a lag of about three months. Okay. Uh, uh, in Atlantic Nino, we have found associations ISMR, but we cannot find a clear, a clear directionality in that uh, in that uh, connection. IOD also has an association with monsoon, and people say that IOD can drive, but unfortunately, that connection is not very clear. Uh, and we have done with different data sets and and looked at, and this is, there is a potential, and some data set. Uh, uh, do so that there is a weak connection between uh, I, IoT driving ISMR, but uh, with small changes in the data set and all that, this does not uh, appear again. So therefore, this seems that there is a possibility of IoT influencing ISMR, but it is a weak connection. The weak connections sometimes uh, are not very uh, um, very stable. Uh, uh, so, so I think one thing that comes out very clearly is that both AMO and and you know are two uh, two uh, 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 two drivers of ISMR, but the other drivers are not very 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 clear, and they may not be independent of independent of uh, El Nino. But AMO appears to be independent of El, uh, uh, El Nino, um, and so and still a driver. So I think this is a new and new understanding that we, that has emerged from uh, from this uh, uh, this analysis. So uh, uh, going going a little deeper. How does this mechanism of how does this uh, um, uh, on how does it work on the intersectional time scale? Does do the North Atlantic SST produce the barotropic vorticity over there, and do that barotropic vorticity affect the upper level vorticity over the North in the North in the, uh, over the Indian region? And that upper level vorticity does it affect the, uh, is connected to the lower level vorticity and rainfall over region? So to do that. We had uh, we had used uh, this North Atlantic. It is on intracellular uh, time scale. So these are the, the data which is filtered on intracellular five-day running mean averages of data, and uh, and use that data uh, on intracellular time scale, and use the long data of that, and and, and do all these statistical calculations, uh, uh, probabilities of uh, of connection. And it turns out something very robust connection comes out as North Atlantic SST is indeed drive these, which is consistent with our correlation, the barotropic vorticity over that region. Uh, uh, and and North Atlantic SST has a direct connection with ISMR intersectional variability. Uh, uh, but that connection happens through these, uh, these barotropic vorticity affecting the upper level vorticity over the North Indian, Indian region. That upper level vorticity is strongly linked to the lower level vorticity that modulates the lower level vorticity. And lower level vorticity, of course, is related to our uh, our rainfall. So it is not so one possibility, some argument, reverse argument can be that, uh, uh, okay, if monsoon is, uh, is fluctuating on intracellular uh, time scale, obviously that will have a lower level vorticity connection uh, associated with this. Uh, and that lower level vorticity will have a divergence, upper level vorticity will be associated with it. But, uh, but this data shows clearly that on uh, the, it is the modulation of this uh, of upper level vorticity is affecting lower level vorticity, not the other way around, or or not the ISMR is not affecting the lower level vorticity. It is the lower level vorticity that is affecting the ISMR. So this is clearly shows that external foreseeing. Are, Sorry, uh, uh, okay, okay, I am done. I am done. Almost done. I am done. Okay, so. So with that, I think uh, a new knowledge has been, uh, I think, established. I think uh, this is uh, something important. Uh, but I'll just con conclude with the future direction. I was almost uh, uh, to the end. Uh, so basically, I think uh, it, it is important that uh, the establishment of this, uh, 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 the connection with the North Atlantic is now, I think, uh, pretty well settled in the sense that so therefore we must try to include that uh, North Atlantic uh, uh, forcing in the in the, in the in the prediction models. Uh, in other words, models must be able to capture those variability in the North Atlantic to improve the ISMR prediction. And in addition to that, I think we need to do 
in terms of prediction, we need to we need to look at potential skill at long lead prediction because these indicate that uh, there should be long lead uh, long lead uh, predictability. But today there is no 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 um, uh, no estimate of long lead predictability. And uh, what is the prediction skill after tw 12 months or 24 months? Uh, we really don't have a, a handle on that. So recently we did some work on that and uh, uh, and and we estimated that actually. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the uh, monsoon Indian monsoon has uh, uh, a pretty high predictability even at uh, 18 to 24 months and this is something something that is work uh, I am not presenting here but uh, it is a work that is uh, uh, under review so I think uh, uh, with that I'll stop and if there is time I will be happy to uh, 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 answer any question thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Goswami, for that very inspiring and uh, exciting lecture. And it is, in fact, uh, great that uh, you have actually opened new doors uh, to attack the unmet potential of the, uh, uh, the potential predictability of the, the monsoon. I think it is quite optimistic. Uh, so I think we have already uh, quite delayed. But uh, if there is any question, I think we can take one question if anyone wants to uh, take the floor. Okay, I see no request for the floor. So once again, okay. thank you very much, okay. Dr. Goswami. Okay. Thank, so you we'll you so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to the last but not the least. Uh, item of today's session. Uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Sanjay Srivastava, uh, who is the Chief of Disaster Risk Reduction Program at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, uh, generally known as UNSCAP. So he has been closely associated with uh, the South Asian Climate Outlook Forum and we, we have been closely working with him. So he will come back to us with uh, uh, the impact-based forecasting uh, angle of uh, monsoon prediction. So he will tell us how the monsoon outlook uh, can be taken to uh, impact forecasting uh, scenario. Uh, Dr. Srivastava, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rupkumarji. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, let me try if I could able to share from my side. Otherwise, I will request uh, uh, my colleague to to manage from your side. So uh, I think there is some problem. So you can share from your side. Yeah. You can share the slide. Yes. Uh, 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 this is I. It's a honor and privilege to talk to some of the domain expert of the monsoon, and I'm just taking you to some a different tracks, different track in the sense that you know in WMO there is there is a paradigm that what weather will be to what weather will do. So similarly, if you take that para paradigm in case of Asian monsoon, what monsoon will be? to what monsoon will do, how it will impact economy, how it will impact the most vulnerable. So there's that story, the narrative which I'm going to share with you uh, is from a professional of uh, United Nat Nation Regional Economic Commission. So it will give you some economic sense uh, of monsoon, particularly the understanding of the monsoon and the monsoon predictions. So this is a narrative on the impact and policy based on the monsoon, uh, based on the monsoon seasonal forecast of the monsoon. So my next slide is going to tell you the uh, before you make any forecast. My colleague uh, Mahap, Dr. Mahapatra has dealt at length. Uh, you need to have a understanding of the risk and impact uh, a priori. The understanding of risk escape. That's the landscape of risk in Asia Pacific, if you convert this in terms of the money, monetize the risk, what is going to be seen is the Asia Pacific region loses $675 billion 
per year. This is annualized average loss. Out of this is the 2.4 percent of Asia Pacific gross domestic product GDP. This is the growth engine of the world, and 2.4 percent losses is quite substantial. Quite substantial, not sustainable. It's not good for uh, achieving sustainable development goals in days to come. But when you do a diagnostic analysis, where the risk where these losses are coming from. We did this analysis and we found that 85% of this 675 billion losses are coming from the climate related disaster, climate related hazards, out of which surprisingly 60% comes from drought alone, which is direct, indirect losses of drought across the multiple sectors which impact the drought. So 60% drought. Uh, 12 13 percent tropical cyclone 12 13 percent floods and only uh, 13 to 14 percent earthquake and tsunami so if you see the risk escape in the region the why how the asia pacific region is losing in terms of the money is 85 percent comes from climate related disasters that is drought tropical cyclone and floods if i come to my next slides our next analysis shows uh, why monsoon is so important because basically the monsoon is a risk driver and when you see the 85 percent of the climate risk of asia pacific this is over the time it is from june to october this is the month where there are largest losses coming from the climate risk profile and that is the time of the monsoon, Asian monsoon. So most of the seasonal forecast that captures this uh, Asian monsoon temporal profile. So you see, for example, the probability of the risk of the floods, it which peaks from August to September down the line to the October. Whereas in case of uh, uh, the, the drought, you see the other. Thing. So what? happens is if you convert this seasonal forecast the time domain to the impact forecast so overlay seasonal forecast to the exposure of the economy people the vulnerable context you can simulate what could be the impact of monsoon this year in asia and pacific so my next slide is going to tell you uh, the impact story this is a methodology that we developed this is a WMO Climate Services. I'm happy Dr. Kumar Kohli is uh, here. He has been the champion of uh, the, 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 the framework of the climate services, which uh, I think now in a operationalized in many ways and also in Asia Pacific region. So we have operationalized this. We have used this hazard information from the monsoon forecast, especially the seasonal forecast, hazard information in terms of all climate related risk. Then we have intersected this in terms of the exposure to the population and some of the critical sector, which is in the framework of climate services like agriculture, energy, health, and disaster management. And then brought it down to the identified the people who are most at risk, risk hotspots, and the potential impact on the economy. So this is the impact-based forecasting framework, which we are following it up with WMO in many countries. So my next slide is going to tell you that uh, uh, if you click uh, the bottom, uh, this is the WMO seasonal outlook of 2021, uh, June, July, August. So this seasonal outlook, how we convert in form of the impact outlook. So if you click the next one, uh, yes, the, you see before you you translate this um, seasonal outlook, you have to see your hot spot of drought and flood in Asia Pacific regions. So left hand side, it indicates the hot spot of drought, floods, and also the vegetation condition during the period when you are making the forecast. And then you look at all three in conjunction, overlay over each other. So whether in a hot spot of the floods where there is going to be a deficit rainfall or hot spot of drought, there is going to be a surplus rainfall, which decides, which gives you a clue how 
could be a impact outlook in times to come, particularly for flood and drought. The next slide is to show you, uh, uh, yes, the next slide is when you over intersect this monsoon, Asian monsoon forecast, what is very clearly we have used the gridded uh, world pop data. It's a very standard uh, gridded information which uh, UN DESA has produced. The population worldwide is in digital form. And then you intersect seasonal forecast. You see 40 to 60 below normal rainfall. There are 670 million people. And where those people are located, it is indicated in the circuit. When 60 plus above 78 million people, where they are located, is indicated. And same, those who are above, below normal. So people who are likely to be affected by floods and drought is indicated. So this is this gives you uh, a clue, a early warning for the early action. The people who are likely to be impacted by this monsoon floods or drought where they are, what could be the possible risk hotspot. The next slide is to show you uh, the most vulnerable. This is the thanks to our UNDP. They have developed a gridded uh, database for HDI, Human Development Index, and you use the most vulnerable people. Nowadays, we call it multidimensional poverty, where the most vulnerable people are located and how they are going to be impacted by floods and drought during this monsoon season. So you locate, you identify, it is spotlighted, the most vulnerable, which will have, which, will, which is going to experience drought in the season or flood in the season. So you narrow it down, identify the hotspot. The next slide is to show to you the, some of the energy sources, the power plant, hydroelectric power plant. Before coming to this, you must know power, hydropower in certain country context is key for energy security. For example, in Myanmar, 56% of the energy comes from hydropower. Same is Vietnam, Cambodia. So in Nepal, it is more than 90%. So if you take the, the, in the, the contribution of the energy in a particular country's power sector, it's very important to develop the impact forecasting. So my next slide is going to show to you uh, the agriculture, which is, of course, monsoon drives the agriculture systems, but especially in the Asia. So when you see which part of the, the season, there is a likely impact of the flood and drought on the agriculture system. And then you look at agriculture from its critical ro role in the economy of a respective country. For example, in India, it's like a rice expert. The global value chain in India contributes 33%. Same, Thailand contributes 19%. Vietnam, 12%. So the lack of flood or drought during the monsoon period is going to impact the global supply chain of the food system. And that's a very important uh, information for the policy, the impact and policy dynamics. The next slide is uh, going to tell you uh, how this information is disseminated for. This information is to come to the, from a research to the analysis to the public, to the public policy arena. We used many of the existing platform. Uh, Dr. Rup Kumar is aware of some of this. Uh, the regional climate outlook forums, we used uh, convert the seasonal forecast to the impact outlook disseminate it to regional climate outlook forum you do there are many regional climate outlook forums in asia asia and pacific region in many countries un scaf has funded monsoon forums and through rhymes we reach down the line at the monsoon forum and then develop the adaptation tool so it's a outlook to impact to preparedness plan and to monitoring this is how you can manage the risk of the monsoon system monsoon season in times to come. My next slide is going to tell you some very specific what we did in South Asia Climate Outlook Forum. So this is a two uh, SASCOP South Asia Climate Outlook Forum, and this was converted from a seasonal outlook to uh, to impact out impact forecasting. So next slide 
we tell you some of the impact forecasting product. Of course, I, I, I don't want to give a toy claim, but what was surprise for all of us was in 2021, when we used the seasonal forecast SASCOF data, three months, I think it was sometime in month of April. And then we brought this uh, impact uh, forecast and then some of the forecast, for example, in August, September, Pakistan was severely hit by heavy rains and experienced urban floodings, 400 life lost. It was indicated very well in advance. So many of the hot spots, which were indicated very well in advance, were found, happened in due course of the time. So uh, it a probabilistic forecast has its own limitations. All of you are aware of it, but it gives you some kind of a a directional, a, a, what we call in the language of the early warning system, early warning to early action. So it narrows down your target area of the response. And that's where the monsoon forecast impact makes a lot of sense in terms of impact and policies. The next slide is to tell you that to operationalize the climate services and particularly the monsoon uh, impact forecasting, we have uh, develop a risk and resilience portal. All the data that I shared with you, because it's a era of digitalization, uh, included the graded world pop data, all infrastructure layer. UNSCAP is a custodian of all energy, the transport, all uh, infrastructure layer. So all the digital databases are here. So you can make use of it. What Dr. Mahapatra, my friends told, uh, these are the digital data. It can be used for impact forecasting at a broad level, not micro, but macro level in Asian regions. So I think this was my last slide. And thank you once again for giving this opportunity. It's important to take science into the policy domain, and this is an effort to take it to the policy domain. So thank you, Dr. Rupkumar. Thank you very thank much. You, uh, Dr. Srivastava for that uh, very encouraging presentation. And in fact, uh, what some of your statements are music to my ears, because we always have uh, this kind of uh, uh, concern that seasonally aggregated information may not be of uh, uh, much use in decision making, but you have clearly uh, demonstrated how even seasonally aggregated outlooks can be taken forward and actually uh, converted into impact specific uh, uh, decisions. Uh, that is that is really very encouraging, and and I, I hope you will continue your uh, support to the climate outlook forums uh, and help us understand the uh, user needs uh, and and uh, try to improve the way we generate our forecast and make them more reliable and more uh, detailed in terms of space time resolutions. Uh, so uh, so before we close the session, if there are any uh, questions to Dr. Shivastav, I think maybe we can take one question. Ashrit, you want to uh, ask something? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> that was a nice talk, uh, Dr. Shivastav. I just was wondering with uh, one of the graphic, which was very interesting, which indicated that floods uh, seem to be have very swift impact and there is only time to respond. There is no actually no time to prepare. While the impact of droughts seem to be like they build over a time. So that gives an impression that there is possibility, there is scope for uh, preparation through early warning and impact based forecasting, things like that. How can we prepare and make use of uh, the forecast for uh, preparing for the drought if you have some vision on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raghavendra. There are excellent, I think NCMRF is, a, is a, one of the frontiers in this area. Uh, uh, what our perspective, particularly from the UN side, was unless you convert your forecast into the impact, uh, you, you heard Dr. Mahapatra's, but in India context. I'm talking about Asia-Pacific region. We bring out uh, World Bank, ADB, UNSCAP, economic outlook. So in economic outlook, we are using the arc of data, the, the seasonal uh, Dr. Rup Kumar what she was highlighting. Uh, suppose if this monsoon season in South uh, Asia, where there are agrarian economies and uh, more than 20% of the GDPs of South Asia depends on agriculture. If there are shortfall in, let us say, if there are more likely floods or drought, 
to what extent it is going to impact the economy. So we bring out uh, a kind of a economic outlook and we are integrating nowadays SASCOF into our economic outlook. So in a country, uh, for example, if I am talking from a UN perspective, a country which has to take decision on the import or export of the food grains, uh, there are countries who are likely to be deficit and those are all the poor countries. So what could be the trade regime? What could be liberalization of the trade? to support the most vulnerable in the country. So those are the policy area. And in case of drought, suppose I must share with you some of the examples in Vietnam, there was a uh, foresightedness, there was a mean say outlook about a drought and the country could able to prepare well in advance. Uh, like you rightly said for flood and tropical cyclone response time is very limited. For drought response time is uh, substantially is, is is considerable in terms of preparing the country and response agency. So it, this is happening. That is where you need impact based forecasting and target those people who are likely to be impacted by drought. That's the reason I specifically pin down Human Development Index (HDI) the the graded data and you just pin down these are the people who will be impacted by the drought so all your drought related interventions to protect the vulnerable and poor uh, should be risk informed and it should be known well in advance right thank you i think that that is a good point to uh, end this uh, very very interesting session uh, in fact this actually uh, sets the scene for for the entire workshop uh, so, uh, I, we had uh, six uh, really uh, high quality presentations from eminent personalities. I think uh, uh, I, uh, we had uh, a lot of information on the regional monsoons and also the impact aspects. Uh, so, this is uh, 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 a, a great beginning for the international workshop on the monsoons. And once again, I thank all the speakers for. Uh, uh, for the for their presentations and also some of our colleagues from from the Americas uh, for staying up very late in the night and and uh, uh, making their presentation. This is uh, very encouraging. So uh, and with that, I also thank the International Scientific Committee for giving me this opportunity of sharing this session. And now I give the floor to the organizers for their housekeeping announcements. Thank you very much, sir, actually, for uh, nicely chairing the session. And this is a beginning, actually, in the morning, our local morning, in fact, we are thinking how this part day will proceed. So everything went well. So I think it was a very good beginning. And tomorrow we'll have a formal uh, inauguration also, where the Secretary General uh, recorded message is there. Our Secretary will be there. And uh, there are many eminent people are there. And then also there are some um, function like IMS will provide the present the Gilbert Rocker, all these things are pending tomorrow. And also many scientific sessions are there lined up. So we, I think with that, uh, we'll close this first day of the session. And uh, thank you to you as well as all the speakers and the, our the panelists who that like Professor C.P. Chang and Dr. Ajit Tyagi sir, Mahapatra sir also give the formal welcome address. So thank you very much, sir. With this, we will just closing our first day of the, you can just visit our website for any uh, further update or anything that is for tomorrow onwards. Thank you very much. Namaskar.